I'm honored to introduce this year's keynote speaker, Rachel Bennett. Rachel is a mom of a child with CVI, a lifelong learner, a powerful advocate for parents like you, and content and community manager of CVI Now, Perkins' newest parent platform. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Amy, so much for those kind words and your warm welcome. It's such a joy to be here. I'm just so honored with this opportunity. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully everything looks okay. Before I dive in, I just want to thank my family. Um, and I also want to recognize all the other CVI parents out there who have been leading the way in sharing their stories. Your stories and your work has helped me get to this moment right here, and I'm forever grateful. Okay, so I remember one morning, one moment here, I got two screens, there we go, that worked, here we go. I remember one morning, morning when Henry was two months old. It was 7 a.m. and I was pushing him in the stroller around the block. He had slept only two hours the night before and I was a wreck. I must have looked as bad as I felt because a woman I had never met came up to me. She looked me straight in the eye to make sure she had my attention and said, it gets better, it gets better. To her, she was imparting wisdom and compassion to the exhausted mother of a neurotypical child at the difficult but all too ordinary beginning of the journey of life. She could have no idea of the extra challenges and emotional upheaval my family and I would face over the years to come. And yet I've held on to that chance encounter every day since. So I'm here looking at you, whoever needs to hear this, wherever you are on this journey, it gets better. And even if it gets worse first, even if you find yourself navigating the darkest moments of your life, there's hope. It can get better. Have faith that it will get better. Today, I want to share my journey with you as a parent of a child with CVI and peek into the collective journey of CVI families. But I wanna go beyond my child's diagnosis story and my personal lessons learned. I wanna talk about the journey of personal growth that we are all forced to travel while raising a child with a disability. My Henry, my first child, my beautiful little boy, who somehow makes everyone fall in love with him as he peppers them with non sequitur questions about their home appliances, where their car is parked and what color their pants are. He is figuring out how to exist in a world not designed for him. Henry is eight years old and he has CVI and ocular impairments, nystagmus, optic nerve atrophy, exotropia, myopia, as well as delays and complexities in speech, motor skills, and processing. It has been a wild ride to say the least parenting this complicated human being. Before diving into the deep emotional challenges of being a CVI parent, let me share with you a little bit about CVI. It is a brain-based visual impairment in which interruption or damage to the visual system in the brain results in difficulties with visual attention and visual recognition. As with many children who have CVI, Henry's visual system is less efficient and doesn't have that instantaneous capture of information that those with an efficient, fully intact visual system have. He has to work harder so much harder when attempting visual tasks. And most materials and activities have to be adapted for Henry to have access. Kids with CVI have unique visual behaviors, which include relative strengths, such as attention to color, light, and movement to support vision use. But in addition to visual attention recognition, they also struggle to recognize faces, interpret facial expressions, integrate multiple sensory inputs, coordinate visual motor skills, perceive fast movement, and access a full visual field. As a result, they miss out on the visual curiosity and incidental learning taken for granted by so many of us. But there is hope. Thanks to neuroplasticity, there is some expectation that functional vision may improve with individualized supports and adaptations. CVI is the leading cause of pediatric visual impairment, but, and there's always a but, the medical and educational community still have a lot of work to do to catch up and fully meet the needs of individuals with CVI. As parents of kids with disabilities, we are catapulted into an arena of vulnerability. When I speak about vulnerability, I look to Brené Brown's research for a definition. She studies courage, vulnerability, shame, and empathy, and is the author of five best-selling books, and I love her podcasts. 
Her work has given me language for my experiences, my feelings, my emotions. Brown's work is helping me develop emotional intelligence and awareness and helping me find wholeness in life with so much uncertainty. Brené Brown defines uncertainty as, sorry, Brené Brown defines vulnerability as uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. Vulnerability is not a weakness. It's a bridge to courage, having the courage to show up, be seen, love wholeheartedly when we have no control over the outcome. And that's really scary. It takes a lot of work and awareness to be in this space. We have to truly believe that we are worthy, we are enough, and we can do hard things over and over again. The arena of vulnerability can feel really lonely. It can just suck. It's a space of tension and paradox, and it is what we bring with us in every interaction with a teacher, doctor, therapist, friend, and family member. Raising Henry for the past eight years is living with uncertainty. I can't count how many times I've thought to myself, I have no idea what to do, and I'm so afraid for my kid. I had so much to figure out. In his early years, I was scared every day for his health and well being. I was exhausted. I couldn't sleep. I was anxious. I was traumatized. And so I think of all of us families raising a child with CBI, with a visual impairment, with complex needs. And I think about all that we've had to adjust to, all the different iterations of a new normal. And then to know that we have to continue to adjust over and over again in the face of uncertainty, pain, and grief. I remember the moment I realized I was looking at a future filled with hard things. I was sitting in Children's Hospital in DC. Henry was about a year old. He was sedated and in the MRI machine. It was a moment they came after an already tough year. Henry had been born at term, but was failing to thrive. He was ne never able to get out of the zero percentile for weight. He didn't sleep. He wasn't meeting any milestones. At five or six months, I noticed his eyes started to shake which I now understand to be nystagmus, but at the time I remember thinking, oh, I bet all babies eyes shake. Little did I know that the visual system is pretty much close to set at six months. And this is what led us to the pediatric ophthalmologist, the neurologist, other specialists, and then to his first MRI scan. And I was just sitting there while he was in the MRI machine, so overwhelmed that I couldn't read anything. I couldn't talk to anyone. I could barely breathe. That was the moment I realized that this wasn't going to be the last time I would be in a situation like this. I needed to figure out a way to do hard things. I need to figure out how to be a parent in a situation I never expected and did not fully understand. Just two months later, Henry was in the ICU for over a week from serious complications from a stomach bug. And there was a moment in the emergency room where Henry was fighting to hold on. And one of the doctors asked me to sing to him and I couldn't at first, I could barely hold myself up. Eventually I made some type of sounds and eventually the ER team got him stable. I put the question to the CBI Now parent community. What was the moment you realized that you were gonna have to do a lot of hard things raising your child, that this was going to be a tough lifelong journey? There were three common themes in their responses to this question. For many, the realization came with an initial diagnosis or even unfolded over a series of multiple diagnoses. For one family, a diagnosis of epilepsy was followed by one for CVI and the need for a wheelchair. For another parent, this moment came with the MRI results showing brain damage, following a month later by a CP diagnosis and then a CVI diagnosis. One CVI mom said, it was on that day that I realized my child has a lifelong disability that will forever impact everything she does in her daily life. And it was going to be a constant struggle and fight for her to access the world around her. Until then, I've been prepared to deal with medical scares and motor delays, but the CBI diagnosis changed everything about her access to the world, education, and future employment. For another contingent of parents, the realization came with a big event or a series of events, a big seizure at two years old, rushing their three month old to the hospital after a major cardiac event, watching their child go through several brain surgeries all before the age of three or after a traumatic brain injury before the age of six months. And yet for another group, the realization came during otherwise mundane moments, 
One family's outing to a busy restaurant sent their one-year-old with CVI into a sensory meltdown, complete with screaming and hyperventilating, leaving the parents exhausted and heartbroken at the understanding that their lives as parents would not and could not be normal. These moments are part of the permanent layer of grief underlining everything else we are working through with our kids. Grief is a broad experience of loss. It is an integral part of the human experience, so common as to be universal and yet so profound and traumatic. This past year during the pandemic, we have all experienced collective grief. The loss of so many important parts of our everyday lives, the loss of gathering with friends and family, the loss of in-person in school, which, oh my gosh, this one hit me so hard, the loss of important events, for the most unfortunate, the loss of our health or even the loss of loved ones who have succumbed to illness. So when I talk about grief that comes with being a parent of a child with CVI and other needs, I'm talking about loss. For me, it was the loss of the popular narrative of motherhood, the loss of predictable expectations, predictable milestones, predictable aspirations for my child, and the loss of a life for Henry without the extra challenges presented by disability. Life will be harder for Henry. I didn't expect to get choked up at this point. <clears throat> Life will be harder for Henry. Unfairly, he will have to negotiate a world not designed for his needs and gifts. Unfairly, he lives in a society that is not accessible. <clears throat> One CVM mom's insight resonates with me. Grief will often hit me at seemingly random times. Recently, my son was stammering and searching for a word and I was just overcome with sadness. His little brain is so full of brilliance and yet there are times when he just can't get the right words out. It's the little moments that get me. Kira speaks for so many of us. It's the little moments compounded with the big moments that we are carrying all the time. At two and a half, Henry was finally in a better place. He was out of the zero percentile. My husband and I were slowly climbing out of survival mode. We had identified a bunch of Henry's food allergies and were putting some weight on him, thanks in particular to sweet potatoes and bananas. We had started early intervention with the OT, PT, and speech and followed soon after for vision services for his ocular issues. We were still negotiating a gauntlet specialist. We still had never even heard the phrase CVI, which would later come to define our lives but we were learning to live the new normal. There was still so much that didn't make sense. We puzzled over Henry's visual behaviors. Why didn't he look at me? Why didn't he recognize me when I walked in the room? Why wasn't he interested in toys, books, and videos? Why did he freak out in new and busy environments? Why did he trip and fall so much? We had so many questions and very few answers. Henry's vision was a mystery. At least that is what every doctor told me. We saw a pediatric ophthalmologist, neurologist, neuro-ophthalmologist. We even saw a pediatric genetic ophthalmologist at the National Eye Institute at NIH annually for three consecutive years. Not one of them so much as mentioned CVI as a possibility. So of course they took the wait and see approach. If these doctors and teachers weren't sure, then Henry's vision must be a true mystery. His pediatric ophthalmologist kept telling me that his vision was fine and that Henry had attention and behavioral issues that need to be addressed. They kept focusing on his inattentiveness and impulsivity. To this day, I wrestle with guilt over actions not taken. I wish I had pushed against the experts. I wish I had dug deeper. I wish I had trusted my gut a little more. We eventually got Henry's entire exome tested to help us figure out a cause, a syndrome, something, something to help me know that this wasn't all my fault, that I didn't do something wrong during Henry's pregnancy something to make all this uncertainty feel a little less chaotic. Genetic testing identified a variant in the ASTN1 gene, which is responsible for sending neurons to their final position in the brain during fetal brain development. It had never been studied in humans, but seemed to be the missing puzzle piece. This one little random mutation had altered the life of our son and our entire family. But for the magnitude of that revelation, it offered us no path forward. We were left with even more questions. I remember feeling really lonely and angry throughout Henry's early years. Why was this happening to my child? Why was this happening to me? I couldn't take Henry to the playground without being overwhelmed with sadness. 
Other kids were walking, running, talking, and playing together. Other parents were able to hang back and talk to one another. But I had to be by Henry's side every moment to help him walk, climb, and swing. I watched in constant fear that he might fall or trip. I, the stress tightened every muscle in my body, and I would come home and just let the grief wash over me, all just from going to the playground. Despite the experts with long titles telling us otherwise, it was Henry's first preschool classroom teacher that set us on the path to a CVI diagnosis. She kept asking me about his vision. Each time I repeated what the experts had told us, that he had attention and behavioral issues. I cannot emphasize how grateful I am that she did not back down. Shortly after that, we visited a vision pre-K class and saw it immediately. These were Henry's people. We watched as they felt around for their food during snack time, just like Henry. Their hands glided along the wall as they walked through the, through, through the hallway, just like Henry. They played with toys in a multi-sensory way, shaking, touching, banging on the ground, putting them close up to their face, just like Henry. Here was another moment of realization that my son was truly visually impaired. That moment taught us more about our son than all the preceding years of work with specialists. Prior to Henry's IEP meeting, he was five years old at this point, we had still never heard of CVI. In that meeting, a vision specialist told us, you know, Henry has characteristic behaviors of CVI. I sat there, mouth open, frozen with confusion and asked, what is CVI? We had spent years working with teachers of the visually impaired, ophthalmologists, neurologists, pediatric neuro-ophthalmologists. Not a single one of them had so much as uttered the phrase CVI. A small sliver of my grief transformed into anger and resentment. And then in turn, some of that transformed into hope. There was finally a path forward. My journey toward understanding started with the foundational books on CVI one by Dr. Dutton and Dr. Lewick, and one by Dr. Roman Lancey. I remember underlining nearly every word in these books because they so aptly described Henry. I remember under, um, they came, this came with the, revela the revelation that no one was going to understand my son for me. I had to be the one to fight for Henry's access. CVI parents talk about this all the time. This is a really hard thing we have to do, to be the one who has to cut the path forward for our kids. One CVI parent said it so well, the constant research, advocacy, and weight of having to be the expert that educates the experts in daily life. It's overwhelming. I wish it could be as simple as, oh, your child is CVI, here, so here are some resources, tips, and local support groups. Here's what we are doing in our community and school for kids like yours. The lack of local knowledge and support is depressing because I feel like I can never turn my back for one second and worry that if I can't get my child the right supports, she won't have access to reach her fullest educational potential. It's an overwhelming sense of responsibility and guilt because I'm just one person. This resonates me, with me so deeply. For the past several years, it's been a whirlwind trying to learn as much as I can about CVI while processing the range of emotions that come with this diagnosis. I became an avid student of CVI. I researched, read, attended trainings, took online courses to learn as much as possible about the visual system, the brain, assessments, adaptations, and educational approaches. Matt Teachin's course on his What's the Complexity Framework in particular was a pivotal point in my learning. I've become a neuroscience nerd. These days I read research articles and books about the brain on a near daily basis. Early in my learning journey, a CVI mom told me about a teleconference call for CVI parents hosted by the New York Lighthouse Guild. This was an emotional and informational lifeline for me in the early days. Connecting with CVI parents has been one of my greatest joys. This community gave us the space to revel in our shared experiences, ask questions, share resources and strategies, and get fired up. The brilliant and fierce community of CVI parents get me through the emotional exhaustion and unsure moments. To know that I have a whole army of CVI families with me when I'm facing an IEP meeting or dealing with yet another one of Henry's meltdowns. To know I'm not alone is just everything. It makes me feel less broken. It helps to show me that I can keep doing hard things. When Henry was five and a half, I connected with the Maryland Deaf Blind Project, Connections Beyond Sight and Sound, to see about getting a CVI assessment. We then found an ophthalmologist who knew about CVI and officially diagnosed Henry with CVI. 
I knew his vision wasn't typical, but I didn't know how significantly visually impaired my child was until after five years of being with, of being his mom. The, this guilt over opportunities missed will always be with me. What if I figured out Henry's CVI on my own? What if I could have somehow filled in all the holes left by our grueling schedule of medical and therapeutic appointments? There are still so many days when I feel like I haven't forgiven myself. And this story is all too common. Some families don't learn about their child's CVI until when their child is a teenager or older, until their child is 15, 19, 26, or 34. This is infuriating. And even when parents get a CVI diagnosis for their child early, some are told that there's nothing they can do about it, which is simply untrue. Children with CVI are underdiagnosed and often misdiagnosed. What if we never learned of Henry's CVI? He would most likely be diagnosed with ADHD and a mood disorder. He had a lot of really difficult behaviors. But I realize now that his outbursts are him communicating his need for access or his visual fatigue. At every level, the system failed Henry and robbed him of years of appropriate interventions and opportunity to improve his use of vision. We know the critical role that vision plays in all areas of development, gross motor, fine motor, communication, learning, behavior, and social skills. And again, I wonder what would be different now if we knew. A few months later, after Henry's CVI diagnosis, I went back to the National Eye Institute at NIH for his fourth visit. Armed with fresh insight into Henry's condition, we both wore our Start Seeing CVI shirts created by an incredible CVI mom and advocate. This time, Henry's doctors heard all about CVI. This was the first time really speaking up big for Henry and it was really scary, but I knew that I had to talk about CVI. We left the appointment with the lead doctor looking up CVI on his research database. I then contacted the head of low vision at NEI about ways that CVI can become a research priority. And just last year, the CVI community responded in a big way to NEI's request for information about their future strategic plan. As a result, CVI was the single most mentioned issue, and now CVI is part of NEI's strategic plan, and families can learn about CVI on their website. Speaking up matters. CVI parents are on the front lines of changing the world for kids with CVI. This is a constant and difficult role especially when your kid is the first kid with CVI that a doctor, teacher, or therapist has worked with. But every time we talk about CVI, we are building awareness. The year leading up to kindergarten, Henry had a responsive and open-minded TVI. She's wonderful. She was the vision pre-K teacher. She was a new TVI fresh out of graduate school and loved learning about CVI. She really joined me in this arena of vulnerability. She asked a lot of questions and took a lot of data on Henry during learning tasks. I'm really grateful for her. Beyond learning how to parent a child with special needs, I also had to learn how to advocate for his education. As I learned more about the critical need for orientation and mobility services for children with CVI, I challenged the O&M assessment that said he didn't need services based on the observation that he could walk in the empty school hallway and get around his familiar classroom just fine. Our kids with CVI have incredible compensatory skills, but clearly the O&M evaluator didn't understand the profound challenge kids with CVI have when navigating an unfamiliar place or a busy, crowded, and noisy environment. We are learning more and more about what might happen to vision in the presence of clutter, multisensory inputs, or with visual fatigue. Individuals with CVI have shared that the visual field is reduced and constricted, vision becomes blurry, and familiar items are only recognizable by touch. Over the last couple of years, we've learned so much about the particulars of Henry's vision. Beyond his challenges with visual clutter and fatigue, he also has difficulty with finding and reversing a route, difficulty with processing fast motions, such as a car driving down the street, a swing on the playground, or kids running around him, and a lower visual field loss. He requires an adult with him at all times to help him navigate environments. So in this IEP meeting, some of, Henry, some of Henry's educators and administrators challenged my assertion that he needed O&M services. They were not really buying it. It is so hard to speak clearly and articulately when the issue is so personal and important. I already wear my heart in my sleeve and now I'm talking about my kid. But eventually we, we broke through, we got, a new assess, and we got a new assessment from an O&M who understood CVI, which in turn led to services. Again, I am so proud that I spoke up in a big way. 
Henry took to his white cane almost immediately, and it is a tool he uses every day for safe navigation and access. One of Henry's classmates in his pre-K vision class was totally blind, and I learned that his family lived close to us. We all met up together at a local playground. I watched as the mom stayed close by her, so her son's side and how she freaked out every instance her son approached a high drop off or other potentially dangerous obstacle. We were both running around following our boys, barely able to complete a sentence or hold a full conversation. It was the first time the playground didn't feel so sad to me. To be able to spend time with a mom like me, a mom who has to go through this world, raising a kid who is visually impaired, made me feel more whole and less alone. I was quickly learning that community in particular, relationships with parents who get it, is what will fill me up so I can sustain myself on this long journey. So I can believe that I can continue to do hard things. As parents, we live with CDI 24 seven. Henry exists in a world not designed for him. His frustration, anxiety, and behavior show his need for access every day. Children learn a tremendous amount through incidental learning, which happens through interactions and observations with the world around them. Henry misses so much of this. Incidental learning teaches foundational concepts that are the building blocks for future learning and independence. But with Henry, we have to teach him everything directly, how to use utensils, how to navigate a new environment, how to draw and write, how to recognize something unfamiliar, how to wave goodbye, how to get dressed, how to use the toilet, how to pucker his lips for a kiss, and on and on. I asked the CVI Now parent community another question. Right now, what is the hardest thing about being a CVI parent? Overwhelmingly, parents echoed my personal feelings that the hardest thing is the relentlessness of parenting a kid with a disability. There is a constant need to advocate, learn, be the expert, and teach others about CVI due to the lack of understanding and awareness of CVI to guide and support the very system that is supposed to be guiding and supporting us. One parent noted, I feel like I'm the only one that can help my kid navigate and interpret her world in an understandable way because I'm the only one who has figured out CVI and did all the learning. Throughout this prolonged period of intense personal pressure to take care of our children and carve out a future that has no place reserved for them, parents feel unsupported by their educational systems. Another parent captured this sentiment. The lack of support and direction are very difficult for me. I often feel like I'm the most knowledgeable regarding CVI when meeting with professionals. So I'm frequently frustrated. I am constantly searching for information on how to help my son. I worry that if I were not so involved, he would not make progress. The grim irony is that the IEP process itself intended to ensure adequate care and education for our children often creates another layer of trauma for parents of children with special needs. Special needs are in fact human needs. The constant advocacy with school teams in order for the child to have access to an appropriate and meaningful education is the ubiquitous experience among CVI families. One parent noted, I feel ashamed that I don't have all the fight in me that my child needs. This one hit me deep. The spiral into guilt and shame is real. The fight is so hard and it doesn't have to be this way. Another CVI parent stated, plain and simple, access to any kind of appropriate help in our state. Beyond the intense care, relentless advocacy, CVI parents face the uncertainty of our children's future. Parents have shared with me so many concerns and worries about the pitfalls, setbacks, and hurdles that await their children. They ruminate on keeping the child safe and helping them navigate the world as they grow up. One parent said, the lack of support and understanding of CVI out in the world makes planning transition as my son approaches adulthood an overwhelming prospect. Once again, I'm realizing that it's on me to forge ahead, cut new paths and create opportunities for him. A parent summed it up, concerns with safety, the frustration with not knowing what he sees, how best to help him, the gap widening between him and his peers, and how this affects him socially and academically, the future and on and on. There's so much, it becomes exhausting to think about it all. It's not okay that it's this hard. We need to do better. We need system-wide change. Henry's kindergarten year was really hard for us. 
It was a big transition. Henry's teacher was smart, kind, organized, and open to learning about CDI, but Henry needed a whole team and whole child approach. Looking back, it wasn't an appropriate placement for him. That year, Henry had a lot of meltdowns and outward behaviors, and as a result, our family experienced a lot of stress. I would have to pick him up early from field trips or from school. He was kicking, screaming, climbing on tables, hitting, crumbling up worksheets. Worksheets for a preliterate child with CVI. Heck yes, he was crumpling them up. I wanted to crumple them up on his behalf. Clearly, Henry didn't have access. His visual, his visual fatigue was overwhelming. Henry's team used general CVI combinations, the black trifold color, but in retrospect, there was never an instructional approach rooted in assessment and data. There was no learning media assessment to assess appropriate learning materials nor a comprehensive vision assessment. I even went so far as to provide a CVI assessment from Dr. Roman herself, but even this was never fully owned by Henry's team. It made me feel like they didn't believe in his ability to become a reader, writer, and problem solver. Every child with CVI, every child with a visual impairment is ready to start their path to literacy. And this path will look different for each, but our kids are ready. That year, Henry's IP meetings took everything out of me. I had so much I wanted to say and problem solve with the team, but it took all my strength just to maintain my composure, just to not break down and cry until after the meeting. And then afterward, I remember hiding under a blanket to watch an hour of stupid TV just to recover a bit. As a former special educator myself, I sympathize with this team. I know how daunting it is to have to learn so much about complex students on top of an already overwhelming job. But this, not knowing how to help a student, is never a reason to put up a defensive wall between you and the parent. We're just trying to share what we know. Our expertise about our child is a valuable part of their IEP program. Educators and school staff, Join us in this arena of vulnerability. Help us learn and problem solve. Help us develop an accessible school day for our kid. This was the year where I was overextending myself by trying to do it all. Adapt all of Henry's materials, take online courses, be his OT, PT, speech therapist, get outside evaluations, and constantly teach his team about CBI. I was in a spiral of fatigue, stress, fear, and guilt. It was affecting my relationship with my husband and my relationship with Henry. I was looking at a future in this huge school district that really had no appropriate placement for him and no creative learning solutions. I was looking ahead to what this would do to my mental health and my family. I also knew I needed more help and I needed to learn how to ask for help. Our lives changed for the better two years ago when we decided to move to the Boston area. We had long floated the idea. I grew up in Boston and still have my family and friends here. But it takes a lot to uproot your life, to change jobs, sell a house, leave friends, walk away from a familiar school system. But sometimes you have to hit rock bottom before you can rise up. Our tough year ultimately inspired us to do the hard thing and take radical action. So far, our gamble has paid off. Henry's pediatric ophthalmologist knows CVI well and registered Henry for the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind, designating him as legally blind. This has opened up the door to services that he has never had before. Henry's new team sees him for his strengths and abilities. They see his CVI. Henry now spends significant time in a general education classroom, socializing and learning with his peers and has a great team of educators supporting him and providing individualized services. He benefits from a flexible and creative learning model. This arrangement enables him to benefit from both social time with kids his age and from working in a quiet space with a special educator in TBI. His TBI is outstanding. For the first time in Henry's life, she completed a comprehensive assessment. I now have a clear picture of the educational impact of Henry's complex visual impairments. This is what the comprehensive vision assessment included. A functional vision assessment for his ocular conditions, nystagmus, ONA, exotropia, myopia. The CVI specific assessments included Roman CVI range, Dutton CVI inventory, Tijin's complexity framework. There is the learning media assessment, which also included Tijin's 2D image assessment. It was an 18 page report with six pages of recommendations. You better believe I was over the moon. 
And for the first time, every team member evaluated Henry as a part of the initial IEP process. It was the most comprehensive whole child assessment experience I've ever had for Henry. His IEP was rooted in assessment, baseline data was included in present levels, and goals and objectives were built from this data. His goals and objectives are connected to grade level standards, even if his individual approach looks different. Henry's making real progress. He's happy. Even when he has tough cycles and life under COVID has certainly brought a lot of those. His school team remains unfazed. They don't blame Henry. They problem solve and collaborate. Thanks to his TVI, Henry is now on a path to literacy. We know how to present print in a manner that is accessible to him. We know which assistive technology that works for him. We know that he's a dual media learner, benefiting from the use of tactile and visual elements. His TVI figured out that when he engages in tactile activities before challenging visual activity, his visual attention and recognition are better. His visual system is more awake. Henry now sees himself as a reader and a writer. He is more confident. Just last month, this TVI shared with me that Henry is able to read some of his familiar sight words in normal black and white print on the iPad. He doesn't need the print and background to be a certain color. The implications of this took a while to set in. I just couldn't believe it. And I said to her, do you know what this means? Someday, really soon, he can pick up a book and read the words on the page. I just lost it and started to ugly cry. <laughs> and all this started with a comprehensive assessment and with a team who consistently collect data and problem solve. I asked the CVI Now Parent community what gives them hope and what keeps them going. And of course, they showed me there's a lot to be hopeful for. Hope is found in our kids, in their progress, in meeting those inchstones, witnessing their happiness, and when they learn something new. Our kids are uniquely incredible. They have developed so many compensatory skills to merely exist in this world. One parent said it so wonderfully. What gives me hope is my daughter's determination and her persistence. She never gives up and doesn't feel sorry for herself. So I take my cues from her. No room for pity parties and stay the course. That's our warrior's motto. At 17, she continues to find ways to adapt and that lights my soul on fire to keep going with her. Hope is found in more CVI awareness and commitment to learning about CVI. A parent wrote, when a provider, therapist, educator, or administrator makes a genuine educated investment in our daughter's success. Another parent said, there is so much more visibility around CVI than there was when my son was diagnosed just two and a half years ago. That gives me hope. I really believe that CVI will someday be well understood and we will not have to fight so hard for our kids to be supported. Hope is found in research and innovation. One parent said it so well. Hope comes from knowing that the brain is like an ocean. We have only discovered and understood a small part of it, which means there is still a lot left to explore in how the brain works, how neuroplasticity works, and how our kids' vision works. And she continued, the speed of technology is making the world so much more accessible to our children, allowing them to reach their full potential. Hope is found in the stories of other CVI families. A parent wrote, CVI groups such as CVI Now give me hope. As I read other parents' stories of their child's challenges and successes, it offers connection with others and similar life experiences, empathy, hope, joy, and perseverance to lead this charge together to ensure our kids have access, opportunity, and resources to meet their full potential. I ask parents what they do to take care of themselves so they can show up for their child with CVI. When flight attendants give an in-case of emergency speech prior to takeoff, they instruct you to always put on your oxygen mask before attending to your child's mask. My husband and I take this as broad advice for life. So do other CVI parents. One parent said, I have to work out for myself. It's always been a part of my life, but the increased incentive is that since my growing son is non-ambulatory, it is now for him too. Another said, taking care of my own medical needs, exercise, sleep, nutrition, meditation, music, reading for, reading for pleasure, and nurturing my friendships and relationships. It takes a ton of energy mental, physical, emotional, social, spiritual, to parent. So I have learned that I need an extra large oxygen mask that I must wear first to be able to care best for my child. What is your oxygen mask? What do you, to, what do, you do to take care of yourself? Really take care of yourself so you can show up for your child. 
For me, one of those actions is leaning into my communities. My community of family and close friends allow me to be vulnerable, ask for help. They allow me to tell my truth and share my needs without guilt or apology. My community of fellow CVI moms and parents give me the support, love, and space to try to make sense of the messiness of CVI. My incredible fitness community, a gym of other women, waking up and showing up for grueling 5.15 a.m. workouts help me develop physical and mental strength, movement heals, breathing heals, sweat heals, but perhaps more importantly, they serve as my daily reminder that I can do hard things. I strive daily to accept life on its own terms and cultivate gratitude. I strive to love wholeheartedly and accept Henry for all that he is. I try to give him full multi-sensory experiences, to be vulnerable in the world, to try new things, even if we're only at a new place for five minutes. The brain is ever changing in response to interactions, experiences, and the demands of the environment. I want him to live fully so he can continue to make progress. I am now thankful for the healing process that comes from grief because it's teaching me so much in addition to my therapist. It's easy to lose faith, whatever this word means to you, with all the barriers and all the uncertainty. But it's an act of courage to have faith even when we don't know the outcome, when we can't control the chaos. I have faith in myself. I have faith in Henry. I know he will do great things. Right now, we are in a big moment for the CVI community. We are on a precipice of change. There is more awareness of CVI in the medical and educational communities, even though that change is yet to manifest for some families across the country. We are seeing more CVI research and the collective voice of CVI families continues to grow. Perkins continues to step up for CVI in a big way and big things will keep coming. Every child with CVI has the right to an early diagnosis, effective vision services, and access to appropriate educational programs. Every child with CVI has the right to access opportunities again and again that will empower them to reach their full potential. We must support individuals with CVI both holistically and as unique individuals and build a world where they can shine and live their best lives. And to do that, we have to keep the faith and continue doing hard things. Thank you so much.